Neither have states or nations met in arms possessed of ampler resources, nor was their own might and power ever so great. Nor yet were they strangers to one another's modes of fighting, which the First Punic War had made them understand. And so variable were the fortunes of war, and so uncertain was its outcome, that those who ultimately conquered had been nearer ruin. We've been spoiled by the Mech Warrior video games. The novelty of the Omnimech has been muted as a result. In universe, being able to quickly swap out weapons or equipment to min max your battle mech for a mission was unheard of for all but the wealthiest and most connected inner sphere mech owners. With so much technical know how lost during the early succession wars, just keeping a battle mech running as is was a challenge. Messing with systems, thousands of feet of cabling, and technology you really didn't understand was a quick way to brick your battle mech and leave someone dispossessed. Though the idea of being able to quickly modify a battle mech's loadout dates back to the Inner Sphere, it wasn't made a reality until members of the scientist cast within Clan Coyote were able to design the modular systems eventually called Omnimech technology. What is often overlooked is just how massive an undertaking that technology was. In order to make it all function, the mechs had to be standardized in their electrical systems, relays, computer systems that can differentiate between weapon and equipment types, the list of changes just goes on and on. Of course, once you're done with a mech, the litany of possible weapons and equipment also needed to be redesigned to be standardized to match the systems of the mech to allow for functional swapping. Beyond just the custom loadouts, which was revolutionary as is, repairing a mech was made all the easier as damaged or malfunctioning components could be swapped out and repaired elsewhere on their own time frame in order to get the mech back out into the field quickly. By 2999, the year the Warhawk was introduced by Clan Smoke Jaguar, the entire process was well refined. This new 85-ton Omnimech ended up being a powerful chip on the table for the Crusader clans who dreamed of making their return to Terra in order to liberate the peoples of the Inner Sphere from their decadent and corrupt governments. At least that was the plan. During what was known as the Golden Century, scientific progress and industrial capacity among the clans had leapt forward significantly. Unfortunately for the Smoke Jaguars, this development was not equally distributed. Their clan's hyperfocus on producing the best possible warriors had led to certain deficiencies in other areas like mech production and research and development and food production and a dozen other things. Holding the other castes in contempt had dulled the Smoke Jaguar's edge and significant efforts were needed to catch up. The Warhawk was both a result of those efforts and a tool for continuing efforts as the clans who faced the mech in trials were often overwhelmed by the mech's substantial firepower. Preying upon the resources of the other clans, the Smoke Jaguars really took their aggressive philosophy to heart. As many of the other clans sought to colonize or build outposts on some of these marginal clan worlds, the Smoke Jaguars did not. After all, why put in that effort when they could just take what they wanted later? Usually, but not always, the endless trials of possession yielded what the Smoke Jaguars needed to keep growing and remain one of the most powerful of the clans. After Clan Mongoose's absorption and claiming several Omnimech designs from Clan Coyote, Clan Smoke Jaguar was in an excellent position going into Operation Revival's return to the Inner Sphere. After fierce bidding to obtain one of the four invasion corridors, Khan Lincoln Osis had high hopes for his three galaxies of Smoke Jaguars on their race to Terra. Confidence, if not outright arrogance, was running the show, rather than prudence or even basic understanding of the logistical needs of an invasion of the Inner Sphere. Among the battle mechs of the Smoke Jaguar fleet barreling toward their destiny was the Warhawk. Galaxy Commander Mikhail Ward halted his Warhawk on the crest of a small hill and surveyed his force. His command star arranged themselves around him, and nearly a double column of Omnimechs paraded past. Beta Galaxy Command, the first Jaguar Guards, and an Omega Trinary left behind by the 267th Battle Cluster before they left for the counter-assault against the world of Mykonos, this was all that was left to Mikhail Ward. The misfortunes of war had deprived him of his base world, then shattered his galaxy into its component clusters, and finally driven him into the role of the hunted. 
The Dragon Roars, campaign book, written by Lauren Coleman and Chris Hartford. Constructed on Huntress and the Fan Industrialplex factory, the Warhawk was given a reinforced Huntress WH structure around a General System 340XL fusion engine. With it, the Warhawk could hit a top speed of 64 km per hour. As far as 85-ton walking death machines go, this was deemed acceptable. The mech's internals were protected by 13.5 tons of ferrofibrous armor, which added up to 259 total points of armor. That was a full 2 tons more than the original Marauder 2C and 1.5 tons more than the Warhammer 2C, two clan mechs that often served a similar role on the battlefields of the clan homeworlds. With 20 built-in double heat sinks and 7 tons devoted to the cockpit and gyro assemblies, that left 32.5 tons of mass for pod space. For comparison, the Kingfisher's standard engine build only allowed for 24 tons of pod space, and the 80-ton gargoyle had just 21.5 tons for weapons and equipment. Even the 95-ton gladiator could boast of just 26.5 tons. Among its peers, the Warhawk offered a tantalizing amount of mass to play with for those looking to create the perfect weapons loadout. At a glance, the Warhawk lacked the graceful lines of machines like the Marauder 2C or the timeless appeal of the Warhammer 2C, but the Smoke Jaguars didn't waste their time or energy on vanity projects. They cared about directing as much firepower onto a target as possible. The other less serious clans could worry about making their tools of conquest pretty while the Jaguars became the Ill Clan. The biggest limitation for the Warhawk's design was the number of critical locations. With just 22 open spots, 14 of them split between the arms, options were limited. However, those of us who grew up playing Tetris on our Game Boys know that this is more of an opportunity than a problem. Surely there's more than one way to cram what we need into this glorious utilitarian beast. The primary configuration is appropriately Spartan in its design philosophy, which appears to be cram as many extended range particle projection cannons into this thing as possible. In this case, four of them were split evenly between the left and right arms, offering the prospect of doing up to 60 damage in one time at a glorious 15 damage chunks. Each of them were aided by the addition of a targeting computer in the right torso, which made them all much more deadly with improved accuracy. Finally, because you deserve a few missiles as a little treat, an LRM-10 rack was crammed into the left arm along with one ton of ammunition, also located in said appendage. While not putting up big numbers, the long-range missiles offer the possibility of causing internal damage on targets once those ERPPCs ripped through the armor plating. That's it for the primary configuration. If points were handed out for simplicity, the Warhawk Prime would definitely earn some of them. As far as heat generation goes, if you're like me and went to public school, you might need a few seconds to sort out that 4 times 15 is 60, which is 20 heat more than the 40 heat which can be wicked away by the mech's 20 double heat sinks. Ignoring the LRM-10 for a moment, firing all four ERPPCs at a target in a single volley left the Warhawk at nearly a standstill, risking an ammo explosion on a 4+, as well as a shutdown on a 6+, and a plus 3 modifier to the next shot. Mo ERPPC, mo problems, am I right? So while firing all four PPCs at once would be incredibly risky, in the context of what we know about the Smoke Jaguars, doesn't it just fit perfectly with their all-or-nothing aggressiveness? Who other than a Smoke Jaguar would push that envelope so recklessly for that one chance at taking down their prey? Remember that these are the warriors who saw an obvious ambush in a canyon on Tukiid and decided that their best option was to run right into it guns blazing. If man-made lightning isn't your thing, which seems like an absurd statement to say out loud, there are still other options in the standard configurations. For example, the A-configuration Warhawk went with a more mixed-bag approach with the installation of an LB-10X autocannon in the right arm along with two tons of ammunition. An LRM-15 was placed into the right torso fed by one ton of ammo. Two ER large lasers dominated the left arm, but they were joined by a streak SRM-6 and one ton of ammunition. All of the non-missile weaponry was aided by a targeting computer in that right torso. And get used to hearing that because every single variant has a targeting computer in it. Now, technically, it's not part of the core Omnimech structure, so you could pull it out for your personal configuration. It's just that no one did for any of the official ones. 
The A configuration is a mixed bag of at least one of everything, and while it might make for some interesting combinations of attacks, trying to imagine actually wrangling all of them in the middle of combat seems unwieldy to say the least. It's the sort of one of everything build which drives me batty, both from a practical in-universe perspective as well as from a tabletop point of view, where I do not want to be constantly looking at the record sheet to remember range profiles for each individual weapon. At least the mech is impossible to overheat even at a run, which I suppose is a plus. I would rate the Warhawk A configuration in a complex algorithm which could determine its value across a series of different metrics and achievement standards, but who has the time for that? It gets three very tired, grumpy beanie frogs that long for a simple pleasure of a farm pond. Moving on to the alternate configuration B, it's another eclectic collection of weapons that look a little bit more well thought out than the A config. B's primary weapon has to be the Gauss rifle nestled into the left arm fed by two tons of ammunition. Backing it up, starting in the mid-range, were a trio of ER medium lasers in the right arm. Starting at nine hexes and moving into point blank were a pair of short-range missile six launchers in the right torso. An emotional support ER small laser sat pretty in the left arm, and just like before, a targeting computer was placed into the right torso that aided the aim for all but the SRMs. Oh, and we don't want to forget that it also had a NARC missile beacon launcher installed into the center torso, along with one ton of ammunition. The B configuration Warhawk is an interesting setup. That Gauss rifle allowed the mech to stand off at longer range, but as soon as the mech warrior could get in there, it would want to be in short range to bring those two SRM-6 launchers into play and to get those NARC missile beacons attached. Now we should probably take a minute to talk about that NARC launcher because it's an odd choice unless you plan on breaking Zellbriggen or expect your opponents to do it for you. It's enough to make me tap my froggy chin and ponder the implications of being that prepared for something that should be a rarity in clan versus clan trials. Hmm. One odd quirk in the Warhawk B configuration was that there were five tons of ammunition in that right arm to feed the two SRM-6 launchers. That's 75 shots for two launchers. This seems like a bit of overkill. The B configuration leaves us with plenty of questions. And the Warhawk C configuration seems to be an attempt to split the baby a bit with the four ERPPC build of the primary config. Two ERPPCs were placed into the left arm, but in the right, two large pulse lasers were added instead. The targeting computer once again offered that minus one accuracy boost for all four energy weapons. Finally, the best addition was a flamer in the center torso so that the C config could host impromptu barbecues of infantry, light vehicles, annoying Cretan civilians, or whatever else you might find around for kindling. Looking at the C configuration's heat generation, it's much more forgiving than the primary, especially due to the addition of three more heat sinks, pushing the total to 23. So with 46 heat dissipation and alpha strike leaving out the flamer while on a run would place the Warhawk at 52 heat. 52 minus 46 is plus 6 at the end of the turn. This is much more manageable with just minus 1 movement the next turn. If the mech stands still, there is no penalty at all for the first turn. After that, choices are going to have to be made. Just kidding, just fire them all until the mech shuts down. This, this is fine. This is all fine. With just 3 hexes shorter range, but minus 3 improved accuracy with the targeting computer, those large pulse lasers are deadly accurate. I'm not going to do the math because numbers are hard and this isn't the kind of Battletech channel, but I'm willing to bet over the course of a battle those LPLs will put up more damage than two ERPPCs would. If I'm wrong, please let me know all about it in the comments section and I will absolutely sit down and read it. Probably not, but do it anyway to feed the algorithm. Just then, four clan PPC blasts ripped into Parker's Whitworth. The poor guy didn't even have a chance to scream before his ammo detonated and the mech became a fireball. When that massacre came out of the smoke, I froze. Never saw one of those monsters on the battlefield before that day, and I pray to God I'll never see another one in person. I've heard a few people call them massacres because that's what they do, massacre their enemies. Hector, I shouted, the massacre! Oh my God, Hector whispered. He fired both LRM racks at the advancing monster and hit it with both flights, but he may have as well been throwing water balloons for all the good it did. Tales from the Cracked Canopy, Blind Arrogance, page 215 by Craig A. Reed, Jr. Though the C configuration was the last of the original loadouts from 2999, 
There was one more designated the Eye Configuration Warhawk, which hit the scene before Operation Revival began. Dated to 3015, the Eye Configuration once again carried dual ER PPCs, but they were paired with two ER large lasers, one of each set into the left and right arms. The targeting computer was there for improved accuracy, and the remainder of the pod space was dedicated to an LRM-5 and an SRM-6 in the center torso. The ammunition for both launchers was placed into the right torso and protected by that standard Omnimac case. The heat generation of the four energy weapons while on the run was 56, and the 24 double heat sinks would wick away 48 of it, leaving the machine 8 plus into the red. That brought with it a negative modifier to both firing and movement in the next turn. Laying off one of the ERPPCs or ER large lasers in a turn makes the mech a cool runner, even if adding in the two missile launchers. It's an interesting use of the ER large laser, but as I look at it, I can't help but think that the C configuration with the two large pulse lasers is the better option. Adding five hexes worth of range for a heat curve that is much more punishing without any damage boost doesn't rev my froggy engine. If you're considering the I configuration, you're probably better off just going with the C. A pair of black puffs blossomed directly over one of his lead mechs and a regular series of sparks flashed from the Warhawk's torso, showering where two artillery shells worth of small bomblets had detonated against the Omnimac's tough armor. The big machine weathered the firestorm with only a slight damage to its armor. For the elementals riding the Warhawk's thick-skinned carapace, the effect of the submunitions was devastating. Two were killed and their companions badly damaged by the slashing anti-armor bomblets. Other mechs showed varying degrees of damage from the artillery barrage. Shadows of War, Twilight of the Clans, Volume 6, page 85, by Thomas S. Gressman. From here on out, the variants of the Warhawk, sometimes called the Massacari by the inner sphere victim of its power, are all post-invasion. The next was the Warhawk D configuration, which incorporated a new piece of technology as well as an Ultra AC-10 autocannon, which we hadn't seen on the mech before. The autocannon was placed into the right arm along with two tons of ammunition. In the right torso, a pair of ER large lasers were added and an ER small laser was put into the center torso. Finally, an advanced tactical missile 9 rack was added to the left arm along with three tons of ammunition. That's 21 shots, however the mech warrior wanted to split up the ammunition types. With its standard 20 heat sinks, the D configuration was slightly oversynced. A full alpha strike on the run, including the ER small laser, generated 37 heat, which left the mech 3 in the green. Good to go, but it does sting a little bit to leave unused heat sinks on the table each turn. Maybe I'm a min maxer after all. Oh no. The D configuration is okay so long as those ATM missiles are hitting. The targeting computer doesn't aid the launcher's aim, so there's a considerable chunk of the mech's loadout that doesn't take advantage of the mech's built-in traits. Without missiles, the mech can theoretically do 45 damage if you double-fire that UAC-10 and are close enough for the ER small laser. More practically, the usual DPS is going to be much lower. If you love the ATM-9 and UAC-10, then the D configuration could be your date to the dance. Otherwise, I think we'd better keep looking for other options. In that same year, 3054, that D configuration hit the scene, so did the Warhawk F configuration. The two ER PPCs returned, split between the arms, but this time they were aided not with additional lasers, but two LRM launchers. The LRM-20 was placed into the left arm along with two tons of ammunition, and an LRM-10 was installed into the center torso along with one ton of its ammunition. The targeting computer is still there in the right torso, and finally an Ultra AC-2 was added to the right torso along with one ton of ammunition set into the right arm. Though it might not appear so at a glance, the F configuration is actually fairly well balanced as far as heat generation goes. An alpha strike on the run was 43 heat, so with its 20 double heat sinks, that's just plus 3 into the red. Only minor heat management can keep that in check over the course of a battle. The F configuration is a fair build that could act as fire support if needed or stomp up close as well. Its vulnerability lies in the ammunition in both arms, one of which, the UAC-2 bin, will be hard to empty quickly. Sure, the Omnimac case is always there, but losing either arm also takes an ERPPC with it. It's something to keep in mind should you go with the Warhawk F. As soon as he was out of line of sight, Gregory swung down the hillside toward the bend in the river and broke his grizzly into a full sprint. 
He watched his tactical display as Bethany rounded the hill, an orange blossom of explosion following her as she too began to race down the hillside. The Warhawk was the first to reach the top of the hill, just as he turned to face it. The Wolf Pilot returned Gregory's previous attack with an immediate burst from its particle projection cannons. The PPCs sent their man-made lightning ripping toward him as if Zeus himself was hurling the bolts of lightning. One struck his right torso, the other slammed into the left. Roar of Honor, page 149 by Blaine Lee Pardo. In 3059, we received our first heavy laser configuration, as there usually is one with these clan mechs. It mimics the original Prime loadout with a quadruple laser setup supported by an LRM-10. Two large heavy lasers sat in the right arm and offered 16 damage apiece out to 15 hexes. That normal minus one modifier to hit was negated by the right torso targeting computer. In the right arm, two large pulse lasers were installed offering their modified minus three to hit out to 20 hexes. Finally, that previously mentioned LRM-10 was added to the right arm, but interestingly enough, fed by one ton of ammo in the left arm. That's a long way for that ammo to travel. All right, we'll just go with it. The five additional double heat sinks were what ate up the rest of the critical locations. On the H configuration, every critical slot is filled. As with most heavy laser configurations, the biggest concern is heat generation. 25 double heat sinks offered 50 heat reduction, which is needed as firing all four lasers generated 56 heat. If the Warhawk H config was running, that's eight plus into the red at the end of a turn, which added both a movement and firing penalty in the next turn. Adding in the LRM-10 pushed the heat to 12 plus into the red, which is another point of movement lost. It's a bit of a challenge, but if you're a big fan of the heavy lasers, it's nice to have the H configuration as an option. I'm just personally wary of the 16 damage over 15 with an ERPPC. I'm not sure it's worth it. Ten years later, in 3069, the Warhawk E configuration added another piece of new technology which would really light up the lives of those it encountered. An ERPPC and a large pulse laser in the right arm act as the mech's primary weapon. At short range, an SRM-6, fed by one ton of ammunition in the left arm, added to the damage output. In the left arm, three new tech plasma cannons were installed and fed by four tons of ammunition. The clan version of the plasma tech weaponry did no direct damage to heat-synced targets, but it did drastically increase their heat. 2d6 heat for those playing the tabletop game. For non-heat-synced units like infantry and battle armor, the plasma cannons do 3d6 damage in five-point groupings. That's a possible 18 damage for those of you who are bad at math like me. But more realistically, the most common outcomes from a 3d6 are between 9 and 12, so that's still decent damage, especially if all three of the plasma cannons hit. The targeting computer once again aided in all the non-missile weaponry, and the heat generation for the e-config was a concern. A full alpha strike while on the run with the 20 heat sinks in play resulted in 52 heat generated and a net 12 heat into the red. Depending upon your circumstances, it might be worth going all out and suffering the minus two movement and plus one modifier to your next firing. It's an interesting build, and of course I'm more likely to be fond of it because of the way the plasma weaponry can mess with the well-laid plans of an opponent. A 2d6 roll for heat has the most likely outcome of 6 to 8, which could definitely give an enemy pause to think about his or her life choices. Joanna, mumbling to herself, started her mad dog toward the formidable Warhawk. As ordered, she was firing everything. Her hands manipulated her joysticks madly. Only a few of her shots hit the mark, and then causing only minimal damage. The Warhawk pilot must have thought he was being attacked by a warrior gone berserk. Getting closer, she took hit after hit to her torso, her limbs, but she came on. Her mech's left knee was nearly shattered, but Joanna managed to keep the mad dog upright and she came on. The armor fell off her mech's chest like feathers off a molting bird. Her heat buildup was reaching dangerous levels, and she came on. Blood Name, Legend of the Jade Phoenix, Book 2, page 256 by Robert Thurston. As we progress down the timeline, the extensive contact between the invading clans and the inner sphere inevitably resulted in salvage being taken from battles. Especially the embarrassing losses on Walcott and Luthien where many clan mechs were left behind in retreats from the field. Since the Warhawk was only produced on Huntress, the mech was seen in fewer and fewer numbers in the Inner Sphere, especially after Operation Bulldog and the destruction of Clan Smoke Jaguar. 
Clanfire Mandrill leapt at the opportunity to claim the partially damaged Warhawk production line following the trials, and after some repair, they were able to start producing the legendary Omnimech again. Reports state that from there, both the Diamond Sharks and Goliath Scorpions obtained the blueprints so that they could produce them at their own facilities. The Warhawk would live on into the later eras through new production and existing owners jealously protecting their machines. In 3114, the Warhawk G configuration was first spotted, and it featured a massive LB-20X autocannon in the right arm which guaranteed any close encounters would be memorable for the survivors. At a slightly longer range of 15 hexes, two large improved heavy lasers aided by a targeting computer dominated the left arm. Though I wasn't able to find a definitive answer, this configuration looks a lot like something the Goliath Scorpions and later Scorpion Empire would produce, as those large improved heavy lasers are their brainchild. They lack the accuracy penalty of the normal heavy lasers while still packing a considerable punch. The targeting computer is once again in the right torso, and finally a streak SRM-6 was added to the left arm along with its one ton of ammunition. The G configuration is clearly a mid and short range brawler. The two improved heavy lasers hit hard with 16 damage apiece, and that LB-20X could be loaded with either scattershot to crit hunt or with standard rounds to add a possible pinpoint 20 damage. Either way, this is a beast you do not want to run into in a dark alleyway. Especially since the G configuration also carries a supercharger which can push the movement profile up to 480. Speaking of Scorpions, one of the most famous recent owners of a Warhawk is Magon Scott, the current Khan of the Scorpion Empire as of the dawn of the Oakland era. After a rough youth in the Sibco where he faced the unique challenge of achieving victories in his trials with pretty serious and prolonged injuries to his hands following an accident, Scott achieved the rank of Star Commander. With talent and a strong work ethic, Scott rose through the ranks with determination. A crucial part of his success was his Warhawk, which he typically kept in his prime configuration. The mech itself was more than 100 years old, but it was meticulously cared for. Magon Scott's efforts paid off with a blood name, and with the respect of many of his fellow warriors, he was an obvious choice to be elected Khan when the time was right. It was under his leadership that the Scorpion Empire went to war with the nearby Hanseatic League. Both of the periphery states were too close to ignore each other for too long. With victory in hand, Magon Scott was wise enough to see the need for changes within the long-established clan system of governance. He ruled over his clan and his new subjects with a lighter hand that was expected. Many of the bondsmen taken from the Hanseatic League were quickly made warriors and welcomed into the Scorpion Tumen. Civilians were treated with more respect, and Scott created the position of Zarkon, which was tasked with keeping the lower castes busy and content. It helped that many of the civilians living under the Hanseatic League were no better off than slaves, so they actually welcomed the upgrade to privileged serf. The future for the Scorpion Empire is promising, and under Magon Scott's leadership, it could represent a major regional player over time. With the Scorpion Empire now producing their own Warhawks, it seems the future of the mech itself is also tied to their success. We can argue about correlation versus causation in the video comments. In our next to last official configuration, the Warhawk L returns to the classic ERPPC with a pair placed into the left arm. In the right arm, an advanced tactical missile 12 launcher was added along with three tons of ammunition protected by Case 2. This is the largest of the ATM launchers, and that means each ton of ammunition is just five shots. By default, they're spread one per type, but depending upon the mission, it's likely that at least two tons would be devoted to one missile type. At short range, two ER flamers sit in the left arm and offer mild damage along with heat on target. A watchdog CEWS system was placed into the right arm along with that ever-present targeting computer. For those of you speed demons out there, a supercharger was added to the center torso which could push the mech's movement profile up to 480, so get out there and set some records. I don't have too much to say about the configuration L beyond my concern with so much weight being devoted to that ATM-12. The Warhawk is so well known for its energy loadouts that just going with two ERPPCs and the ER Flamers just doesn't seem like enough. Perhaps there's an ATM superfan out there who just loves this configuration. To that person, I say, have fun. Our last official Warhawk is the T configuration, and for reasons that might be readily apparent, it calls to me. Two ERPPCs dominate the left arm for that usual blue fire and fury, but in the right arm, two plasma rifles were added along with three tons of ammunition. 
That's 15 shots apiece if you haven't done your homework and committed the plasma rifle stats to memory. There will be a quiz on Friday, so don't slack. Finally, a Rocket Launcher 10 was added to the center torso for that one-time surprise for a target that gets too close. The targeting computer is still there in the right torso, which aids for both the ERPPCs and the plasma rifles. The heat generated is a bit of an issue as an Alpha Strike on the run without the Rocket Launcher nets a plus 12 into the red at the end of a turn. Not great, but also not insurmountable if you have that perfect moment to let your inner smoke jaguar out to party. Overall, I like it a lot, but now I have to get a little creative with my MF configuration. Thanks a lot, Config T, making my job difficult. Can't just slap plasma rifles on and call it finished now. Sheesh. For the MF configuration, I left the targeting computer in the right torso where it belongs, but bumped the number of heat sinks up to 22. For primary weapons, a pair of snub-nosed PPCs were installed into the right arm, and a large pulse laser was added to the left. Between the three, there's a possible 30 damage and 10 damage chunks at the snub-nosed PPC's short range. Joining that large pulse laser in the left arm are a pair of ER medium lasers. Finally, a passive-aggressive anti-missile system was added to the center torso with the ammunition stored in the right arm. It'll knock down incoming missiles, but you can tell from the tone that you're probably going to pay for it later. The ammunition had to go there so that I could cram in four jump jets to make a jumping Warhawk, just as our noble Alexander Kerensky would have wanted. The new movement profile of 464 is hopefully enough to make you want to try out this 85-ton brawler. With 22 heat sinks, the Warhawk MF can fire all of its weapons and jump the full four hexes and stay heat neutral. If the AMS triggers, it'll be just plus one into the red. This is a machine that can consistently put fire on target without any ammunition concerns beyond that of the AMS. If you want to give it a go, I've included the PDF record sheet for it in the video notes below. If it performs well, come and let me know in the video comments. If it fails miserably, come and weave an elaborate lie in the video comments so that I believe it's a success. As I aspire to retain my position as YouTube's number one Battletech-themed hip-hop country fusion artist, I can't help but feel hope for the Warhawk moving forward. While many of its traditional configurations tend to fall into a cookie-cutter format, there aren't any that are flat-out bad or that you couldn't have fun with on the tabletop. With the Scorpion Empire and very likely the Sea Foxes producing their own design, I hope it keeps showing up in the lore moving forward into the Ilkhan era. From Aiden Pride's run-in against the Warhawk in Trials, to Katrina Steiner Davion's bizarre victory using the mech to test into warrior status with the Wolves, this is a battle mech that always leaves an impression. Colorful characters like Jeremiah Rose and people of great influence like Theodore Carita have all used the Warhawk to bend the battlefield to their will. So why do we love the Warhawk? I suspect it's because it's very good at its job of spewing blue flame at unsuspecting targets from great distances. It does so without grace or beauty, and I think we like it that way. Selah. Do you have a Warhawk story of fame and glory? Is there a variant that you prefer over all the others? Let me know in the comments and we'll keep the conversation going. It's been a while, but I'd like to thank the talented people on the MechFrog Discord channel who regularly offer photos of their spectacular mech paint jobs for these videos. They add a little razzle-dazzle to the show, and I'm continually honored by their efforts to keep up with my frantic pace of video construction. If you want to join in on the shenanigans, you can join the Discord too. I've posted a link in the video notes below. So with that, I'll gracelessly exit while tooting this horn. Be good to each other, and remember that only you can prevent forest fire. No, wait, that's the bear. Please take care of yourselves, and make the world a slightly better place today and tomorrow.